Happy Sabbath, church family. Happy Sabbath, church family. God is good. And all the time, I'm inviting you right now to go ahead and stand to your feet as we get ready for another Connection Sabbath. Amen. It's also Hispanic Heritage Month, and it is the first day of our Jesus at the Center series. So we got a lot going on today. There are baby blessings, baptisms, and so much more. So God has a lot in store. Amen? Amen. And so right now, I'm going to invite, as you can see behind me, the youth is right back here to lead us out. And I'm inviting uh, uh, Lanaya to come and lead us in prayer today. Close your eyes and bow your heads for prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for giving us another day of life. I pray for those who are on their way. I pray that everybody's hearts are touched as we sing and worship you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So we have, all of the youth are just going to be leading all of these songs out. Praise God. The Bible says, that weeping endures for a night, but joy comes when? Come on, church, joy comes when? In the morning time. Yes, that's right, put your hands together.
out today church can you please encourage our youth today can you please give them just a lot of encouragement keep them praising God he's the God of the beginning the God of the end he is God alone
Thank you, Jesus. You may be seated. say amen for all the other gods of the nations are idols but our God made the heavens and the earth our God does not demand worship but our God deserves worship happy Sabbath everybody good morning neighbor we thank God for the privilege of coming together to worship a God who is worthy of all our worship let me welcome every worshiper here those who are our guests those who are members of the local congregation, those joining us online, we thank God that we can be here to worship Him. And God has blessings in store. My heart is encouraged when I see the next generation affirming who God is. Come on, say amen. amen. The next generation embracing the fact that our God is extraordinary. As we've come together, we've got just a few notices for you, just a few FYIs. Please uh, pay attention. Of course, uh, we this is the commencement of our annual series, Jesus at the Center. And for this year, we are focusing on Jesus at the Center of our future. How many people know that if your hand is in the hand of God, the God of the future, your future is secure. How many people know that? How many people know that if your hand, if your life is in the hand of God, your, your future is secured? And that's what we'll be doing through these uh, next uh, five or so sessions. Please ask you to be here. We'll continue. We continue tomorrow evening at 730 and then on Wednesday at the same time, and then on Friday at the same time. I encourage you to be here. We end the next next Sabbath. We will be we will start gathering about uh, six thirty to seven. Between six thirty to seven twenty will be time of fellowship. We will have we will have refreshments available, and so you can come directly here. But we'll be, uh, we'll be ending refreshments at about 7.20. 7.20, 7 uh, you should be taking your last bite of the refreshment. So between 6.30 to 7.20 uh, each evening beginning tomorrow and Wednesday and Friday, we'll have our fellowship time, our gathering time, and then we get right into meetings. It shouldn't be for more than 90 minutes. We're also going to be having gifts available uh, for different individuals, not only our guests, we're encouraging you, we're encouraging you to come and bring someone with you. Can I tell you this? Can I tell you this? Can I tell you this? These meetings are best enjoyed with someone else. Amen? Bring someone with you. Amen? Bring someone with you. Uh, you know the saying, if you can't bring a friend, let a friend bring you, all right? If you can't bring a friend, let a friend bring you. Don't come alone as we, we affirm that Jesus is indeed at the center of our future. All right, uh, our, next, uh, our, next, our next FYIs will be having a constituency meeting uh, this evening. It will be at 7.30. It will be on the Zoom platform. This is for our, our, our school, the Sawgrass School. We have some important decisions and some information we want to share with you. Please uh, note the time and the Zoom information there. Our men will be having our prayer breakfast. Uh, you can be part of this. It starts at 9. And it has been my experience, and I don't believe it's going to be any, any different, that when the men have breakfast, it's not just sandwiches. Amen. Is not just bagel. I hope I'm not setting the brothers up, but I know when they have breakfast, it's not, Ricky, it's not just bagels, right? It's not, it's never just bagels and cream cheese. It's real breakfast, amen? Real breakfast, and we'll be doing some real praying. Uh, uh, but, but come on out, come on out. Uh, we'll be having a very important speaker and presenter talking about issues that scratch men where they itch. Uh, men or pause, men or stop. Wow, uh, that, that, that's, that, that's interesting. Of course, on the, uh, the, the weekend of the 18th and 19th, uh, Pastor Javier Diaz will be here with us. 
Uh, he serves our conference as the field secretary for the, the, the North, uh, North Florida. He'll be here sharing with us beginning of Friday. And then on the 19th, he'll be merging right into our International Sabbath. International Sabbath, I have some instructions for you. In the evening, we'll be celebrating the varied cultures that God has exposed and blessed us here. I thank God that I'm a part of a church with varied cultures. I'm in the wrong church. I thank God that this church is made up of people from different cultures. Come on, say amen. Uh, not just Jamaicans, amen. Not just Haitians, amen. Not just Puerto Ricans, amen. People from different parts. And I believe that when we, when we, when we have this experience, it gives us a glimpse of what heaven is going to be like. Amen. How many people know that, 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 that not only Jamaicans will be going to heaven? How many people know that? How many people know that? How many people know that not only Haitians will be going to heaven? How many people know that, right? Heaven is going to be made of people from different uh, experiences. And so we got a chance to, to model it here with our International Day, One in Christ. As I said, Javier will be here to share with us, to lift that up we'll be having in the evening the program so please uh be ready to give a brief history of your country uh different uh uh symbols uh some of the music the typical music i'm still remembering carlos and uh and his wife doing that jamaican song and i think uh some time ago we even had plantations own bob marley showed up the last time I remember. Uh, but please uh, be prepared for that and bring your uh, their dishes so we can sample their dishes. One more thing, the, the One Blood folks are here and I know I can, I can verify with Pastor Mike that it's okay to give blood on the Sabbath. Right, Pastor Mike? Right? He said it's okay. It's okay to give blood on the Sabbath. Uh, so the, the bus is there and they do have, they do have an incentive for you they do have an incentive for you, a $20 gift card. But more importantly, the blood you give will be saving the lives of at least three persons. Right, Kirk? Right, Kirk? Right? Blood you give will be saving the lives of others. Amen? And so it's important right after church, go right up. Um, I do believe in the cause. And by the way, they did give me a pair, uh, two pairs of pretty socks to make the announcement. And so, but that being said, I want to encourage you, please, uh, give blood. It's one of the beautiful things you can do on the Sabbath. Let's pray together as you affirm God's presence in our midst. Father, we thank you for the Sabbath. What a blessing. What a gift you gave to us when you gave us a Sabbath. We pray that you'll, you'll help us to enjoy your rest, your peace. May your presence rest, remain, and abide in each heart. And may we leave this setting, this worship setting, better than we came, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Sabbath, boys and girls. Happy Sabbath. Today we are going to talk about a compass. Does anybody know what a compass is? Raise your hand. Oh, what, what is it? I have a flowers. <laughs> what do you think a compass? It, it's something that has the four directions and help, and it's on a map. And what does a compass do? Uh, tells you where to go, like north. That's right. So a compass is a little tool that helps people find their way. So with a compass, it has a needle, and no matter which way you go, the needle's always going to point north, so you'll know which way to go. 
So it helps us stay on the right path when we're lost. And today we're going to learn about how Jesus is like a compass in our lives that points us in the right direction. So in Proverbs 3, verse 5, it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he'll make your path straight. So just like a compass shows us the way, Jesus shows us the way and how to live our lives and follow directions. So I'm going to tell you about a little boy named Sam. Sam loved to explore. And one day, Sam went into the woods. And when Sam went into the woods, what do you think happened to Sam? That's right. He said that he got lost. So if Sam got lost in the woods, what do you think is a tool that he could use to help find his way? Compass. <laughs> that, that's right. So he was lost, and before he thought about his compass, he was looking all around. He was trying to use the trees to remember which tree he saw or a bush to remember which way he went, and he could not find his way. But then he remembered that his mom gave him a compass. So he went in his book bag, and he got his compass out, and his compass was able to help him find the way back home. So in the same way that Sam was able to find his way, as we get older, we are going to feel lost sometimes. We're going to feel unsure about what to do. But if we keep Jesus at the center of our lives, he will guide us just like the compass guided Sam. In John 14, verse 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So Jesus is the way that leads us to everything good in our future. If we trust him, he'll guide us through school. He'll guide us through fr friendships. He'll guide us with our families and with every choice we make. So you can use a compass as a reminder to follow Jesus. And just like the compass always points north, Jesus will always point us to the way when we're making our decisions. Does anybody want to pray for us? Okay, well, I'm going to get two prayers. So you can do one, and you were the first to raise your hand. So maybe we could do one more. Here, you go first. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Sabbath truth. Thank you for blessing the Holy Sabbath truth. And Lord, please help us to be good, praise and worship you every day, pray morning and night, and keep the people safe over the hurricanes, and... Help us to do the right things and help us to choose you instead of the mark of the beast. Amen. Amen. Beautiful. You want to pray for us? Okay. Dear Jesus, um, uh, dear Jesus, thank you for my me daddy, for my brother, for the seven. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> amen. Thank you. Wow, it's a beautiful thing to have our children in our midst. Before we get to the to the collection of the tithe and offering, I'm going to ask uh, Valerie and the rest of the family just to join us here and the elders were nearby just to join us as we pause to recognize God's gift that he has blessed them with uh, come come right ahead family come right ahead they should be out those doors can we can we get them right away We thank God that we can be a part of this celebrating with the family and friends. You can come right up. 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 Uh, you can join us. Or elders are here. You can join us. Valerie and Irvin Chase I want to share with you 
Matthew's Gospel, chapter 18, verse 1 through to 5, our Lord. Matthew reports, at, the, at that time the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, But surely I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name, Jesus says, receives me. We, we thank God that we can celebrate with you, Valerie and Irvin, this gift that God has given to you, Chase. Smartly dressed, cute as a button, amen. And the family was, that's here to celebrate your presence here is affirming two things, that you recognize that Chase is a gift from God. Amen? It's a gift from God. Uh, I believe that men may make mistakes, but God make babies. That every child who comes into this world, God has a plan for. And that your presence here is affirming that you want to assume the responsibility of raising him right. As the saying goes, children are not going to raise themselves. Somebody's got to do it. And God has purpose that you, Valerie, and you, Irvin, would be part of his life. God has given him life for you to navigate his life. And God has blessed you with some interesting experiences, Irvin, that only you can share with him from a male perspective. And God has blessed you with some interesting experiences, Valerie, that only you can share from a female perspective, that God in his wisdom has ordained that both male and female should raise a child. Because there are different things that you are well equipped with to pour into his life. And as a family, as a church family, we're seeking to covenant with you in this awesome responsibility. We're going to be praying for you, uh, Irvin, and praying for you, Valerie. And please know that you're not in this alone. Let's bow our heads. Father God, we thank you for life. We thank you for Valerie and Irvin and their presence here, along with the rest of the family, recognizing that you are the giver of this gift of life. They've called Chase. And Lord, we've come to covenant with them in the rearing of this, this boy. We can't bless, but you can. And so we ask that you will rest your hand upon his head. That your hands will be on both sides, on his back and in front. That even down to his smallest toe, the Lord, you will shield him. We pray that you will give Irvin and Valerie the patience and the knowledge and the resources necessary so that like Jesus, Chase will grow to full statue in favor with you and with man. And so Chase, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord calls his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Congrats, congrats family. We got a gift for you, uh, his certificate and his first, uh, first Bible. First picture Bible, amen. And uh, we, 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 we don't want you to send him to church. We want to take him to church as you did, right? You're now part of the church family. Amen. Amen, church. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Praise God. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you, family. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. As we've just seen this uh, baby dedication, we, we look at our responsibilities even to the young ones. And um, we use it as an example. As I talk to you now about giving, I want you to think about how you learned to give. How did your parent teach you to give? 
And as parents, you are in fact the first gods to your children. They know no 28 fundamental beliefs. They do not know Seventh-day Adventism or Baptist or any of those things. What they do know is you. And so God has honored you with almost God-like supremacy in the life of your child. So like God taught us in his uh, word in order to tithe, he wants to teach us how to give. Let me just call up the uh, ushers as we sort of, uh, as we go through this um, process of thinking about giving. Let us have an offering for this, uh, a prayer and an offering. Let us, let us pray. Lord, we thank you so much that you as a loving father have given us so much and ask only a little in return, more than ever you ask for our hearts. So we ask you to bless this offering that's about to be collected. Let it go to your work and to your gospel's message and to the turning of hearts to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So just like we as parents actually teach our children through example, God actually uses tithes, for example, to teach us a system of giving. But where he wants to go with this is furthermore, he wants to teach us how to give from the heart, out of sincerity. And with the widow's might where he mentioned that he pointed out the widow given all that she had that was sacrificial given. Nobody would have noticed that because she wasn't one of the wealthy. She wasn't given a lot. It wasn't her. It was surreptitious. And so God wants to say, you've learned. I've given you a system. It's tight. But now I want you to give from your heart free will with no pressure, no guilt, just as the Spirit moves you. And so I ask that you pray about what you want to give and you decide how you want to give in the free will given not in an obligatory fashion that is what god wants he wants sincerity he wants faith and he wants sacrifice thank you we thank you that you've given before in the past and that you continue to give jesus sees that even if nobody else does It's that special time again Amen. Amen. when people say yes to Jesus Amen. and come and follow him. Today, as we contemplate Jesus at the center of our future, two newlyweds declare their desire to please God, their decision to turn their lives over to him. They declare that they want to live right in the sight of the Lord. Is, where is Rosetta Morris? Rosetta Morris and Barbara Samuels. Um, so I'm here to present these two individuals. <laughs> Here's Rosetta. And um, the first individual is Sabrina Diana Morris. It's our pleasure to present Sabrina. Sabrina was born in Montego Bay, Jamaica. As a child, Sabrina went to multiple churches in the neighborhood. When Sabrina grew up, she chose to attend the Kingdom Hall of Jehovah's Witnesses, but they did not acknowledge the Seventh-day Sabbath. When Sabrina came to the USA, she continued her search for the truth. She wanted to comply completely with God and his word.
Sabrina got married to Paul Clark on August 23, 2024. They are newlyweds. She accompanied her husband to his place of worship, the Plantation Seventh-day Adventist Church. She discovered that the preaching here is in line with God's Word, the Bible, that we worship on God's holy day, the seventh day, Saturday. <clears throat> Sabrina wants to be baptized now to please God, to turn her life over to Him. Sabrina wants to grow in the knowledge of God. She wants to work for God by sharing the truth with others. Sabrina Mars. We thank God for Sabrina. And as you heard, she and Paul got married recently. Congratulations. But I'm here to tell, I'm here to tell Paul that there is somebody that Sabrina loves more than him. And that is Jesus. But here's the beautiful thing, Paul. The more she loves Jesus is the more she'll love you. And so, Sabrina, because you love Jesus, we baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the sweet Holy Spirit. Let all God's people say, Amen. 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 Stay, stay. to recommit his life to God so that he and his wife, Sabrina, can serve the Lord together as one. Paul wants to live right in the sight of the Lord. Amen. We thank God for Paul's commitment. I notice how they both were zealous in their preparation for this. And Paul is leading by example. Amen. Leading by example, and so Paul, because you love Jesus, we baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the sweet Holy Spirit, and all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. Scheduled baptism is on Sabbath, October 12th. That is next Sabbath. Amen. Now is the time, today is the day, to enter into a covenant relationship with Jesus Christ. He's coming soon.
Happy Sabbath once again, church family. Can we all rise as we continue in worship today and as the youth continue to lead us out in this amazing Sabbath day? Regardless of your situation, let your worship rise in the midst of the confusion that you're going through, in the midst of the struggles, the trials, whatever it is. Because whatever the enemy's trying to do to you, remember, praise confuses the enemy. So let your worship rise today and watch God deliver for you.
Let your voices cry out. Someone say hallelujah. It's all for his glory. It's all for his glory. For your glory. Continue to encourage our youth. Aren't they doing an amazing job, church family? Praise God.
gotta be where you are. Yeah, Say yeah. I wanna be where you are. Come on, sing that out. Gotta be where you are. be your life's mission. Let this be your goals, your ambition for each day. this place. Say hallelujah. Praise God. God is here. And wherever God is, blessings are in store. As we move into this season of prayer, we do so not just out of formal fashion, but we do it because we know we serve a prayer-answering God. And so as we bow our heads and kneel and seek God today, if you feel so inclined or impressed, you can join me here at the altar, knowing full well that there is nothing too hard for our God knowing full well that that which you came with, perhaps harassing you, perhaps burdening you, that that which you came with, you can leave it right here. That you can leave this worship experience change, renewed for your glory. For your glory. Father God, we've come into this sacred space, this sacred hour, this day that you've appointed for us to convocate with you. We declare and affirm that this is not some ordinary day. Ah, you were there with us on Sunday and, and Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and even Thursday and even Friday, but, but you did promise that when we come together on the seventh day, that you, God, will come down in all your glory. And so we just take the time to affirm that right now, that you're in this place, that before time memorial, you set this appointment with us, that we'll meet on this day at this place, at this spot, long before our grandparents knew each other, you appointed this day. And Lord, we pray that we will leave this session having experienced 
your glory. We praise you and we lift you up. We exalt you. We offer to you our sacrifices of praise. We affirm that there is no God but our God. A God who does wonders. A God who performs miracles. A God who is patient and, and long-suffering and full of grace. A God of love. We thank you that you have never treated us as we deserve, but you've treated us as Jesus deserved. And so it is in, it, it's in his name we approach your awesome presence today. We come in the name of Jesus because our parents did tell us that there is power in the name of Jesus. They told us that there's victory in the name of Jesus. They told us that it's not just some ordinary name, but in the name of Jesus, even demons will flee. And so we come with our burdens and with our problems and with our stresses and with our anxieties and with our difficulties. We come with the things that annoy us and the things that are pressing on us. And we come to this altar today saying that there is nothing too hard for our God. We come to this altar declaring that with men, they, this may be impossible, but with God, there is no impossibility. And so we lay it before you, our cares. We lay it before you, our fears. We lay it before your anxieties. We lay it before you, our burdens, our dysfunctional relationships, our screwed up bank accounts, the fears over our jobs. That child who is giving us and driving us up the wall, we place it before you. That cantankerous neighbor, we place it before you. That news we got from the doctor this week telling us that it doesn't look good. We place it before you because you're able. Give us the victory. May somebody leave this service today experiencing victory. We thank you for the provision you've made for your word to be presented. We thank you for our speaker, Pastor Dr. Gervin Mars. We thank you, Lord, for the many years you've been using him in ministry to expand your kingdom. And as he comes one more time for this morning, we pray, Lord, that you will give him a fresh anointing. The anointing for this morning is not sufficient. We pray that you'll give him a fresh anointing, that you'll take control of his brain, of his heart, of his lips, of his tongue. And that the words that will emanate from his lips will resonate with some heart today. And that somebody will fall in love with Jesus because of the foolishness of preaching. And so we lift you up and we praise you and we say thank you in Jesus' name. Somebody say amen. Somebody shout glory, hallelujah. I want to be where you are. As the Jesus at the Center series begins, we pray that he's not only the center of our lives, but especially the center of our joy. When you think about where the world is right now, we need joy. We need him to be the center of our joy.
that's not all. Come on, someone sing this part with me. Come on, say it. Jesus at the center of it all. Someone say this. Say Jesus. Say Jesus. You are the center of my soul. Come on, I need one or two or three of you to say Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. I know for some he doesn't need introduction, but there may be some who don't know him, but for quite a, some time now, God has been using our speaker, uh, Pastor Dr. Gervin Marsh, to expand the kingdom. I thank God for his friendship and collegiality. From Brevard County all the way down to the Keys, he seeks to supervise us as pastors. And so he serves not only as colleague and friend, but Pastor Mike, he's, all, he's also my boss. He's a good boss, by the way. <laughs> And I thank God that with all the things that he has to do, Jean-Paul, he has decided to come and share these few days with us. And I know that lives will be born for the kingdom. Thank you so much, Pastor. As he comes, may you hear him and the word. Thank you, Pastor Rose, for your kind words of introduction. Good afternoon, everyone, and happy Sabbath. I want to welcome you to this, the worship experience here at the Plantation Seventh Adventist Church. And thank you for joining us today, whether you're here in the building or you're joining online. Thank you for making this church the choice or church of choice for your worship experience today. If you're visiting and you're looking for a home church, I want to let you know you're at the best church. Amen? Amen. 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 So before you leave, please talk to the pastor or to one of the greeters, and they can help you to arrange for you to become a permanent member of this church. We're here this week, starting today, on their, in this experience called Jesus at the Center. 
the center of your future. And we'll be here tomorrow night. We'll be here Wednesday night, Friday night, and back on Sabbath. This is our yearly evangelistic effort where we present Jesus, who was promised that if he is lifted up, he will draw all to him. And so we're praying that as he's lifted up, your lives will be changed, and you too will give your life to Jesus. And so we rejoice for the two precious souls that were baptized today. What do you say? And we believe that many more are here who need to say yes to Jesus. So as the word of God is preached and the spirit of God speaks to your heart, don't harden your heart, but accept today Jesus because today is the day of salvation. We have individuals ready to study with you, to pray with you, and to walk with you through God's word so that you can walk all the way to glory with Jesus Christ. So listen to his voice and say yes to Jesus, who must be at the center of everything. For this week, we'll be pay, uh, paying special attention to the prophecies of God's word, and we'll be journeying through the book of Daniel specifically and the book of Revelation in some regard as we seek to understand more about the prophecies of God's word. I must let you know that as a church, we were literally birthed because our pioneers studied the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation, and they were insisting that in whatever we do, Christ must be center and central to the prophecies of God's word. And so this initiative is designed to show you how Jesus is central to the prophecies of the Bible and how he's essential to your life and to my life. And so I want to encourage you to join us. Each night when we come, we'll start with refreshments. I think from 6.30, there'll be light refreshments. So join us. And you don't have to leave work and go home. You can come right here. There'll be refreshment provided for you. And we'll have good fellowship before we enter the study of God's word. So I know if I should ask for a show of hands of those who will not be here tomorrow night, none of you will put up your hand in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Oh, we had one brave soul over here. Well, she'll join us online. Amen. Amen. So even if you can't be here in person, make sure you join us online and share the link so that others can be blessed. I want to welcome all who are here, but I have some special friends that are here. I have my friend Nova and Noveen that are here. Good to have you. You're somewhere here. There they are. Thank you for joining us in worship today. My family was in the first service, and they're not here now. And I want to thank God for them and for their blessing in my life and in my ministry. But I still believe church has to be a happy place because David says we must enter his presence with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. So let's share the love of Jesus. We did it this morning. We'll do it again. Just turn to your neighbor and say to that person, I would have been the most beautiful person here today if you were not here. Go right ahead. Go right ahead. <laughs> amen, amen, amen. I hear somebody saying, I can't tell a lie in church. <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> well, the truth is we're all beautiful in the sight of God. What do you say? I want to celebrate your pastors and thank God for them. Pastor Costa, Pastor Sport, Pastor Rose, God continues to use them, continues to use them to be a blessing here. And if you're grateful for them, let me hear the church say amen. amen. They, they, they are also married. Well, with the exception of Pastor Kevin, not yet. But I decree and declare in Jesus' name that he will get married. Amen. Not like, where's Pastor Kevin? Where is he? I but I decree and declare. So <laughs> I want to thank God for their spouses. I know I saw Sister Rose here earlier today. Sister Rose, God bless you wherever you are in Jesus. Oh, there she is. There she is. And I know uh, Brother Forbes wasn't able to make it here today, but he is here with the kids at home. And so we pray God's blessings over the families and the ministry God has given to them. Stand with me in honor of God's word and take your Bibles in hand. And let's go to the book of Daniel. Second, Daniel chapter 2. We're, not going to read, we're going to read verses 10 to 13 and verses 45. Now the good thing about the second service is we, we, we can stay here for however long we want. So by God's grace, I'll get you here out of here before 12 midnight. Is that all right? 
Amen. Daniel chapter 2, verses 10 to 13, and the 45th verse. I'm reading from the New King James Version. You can follow along in whatever version you have. Daniel chapter 2, verses 10 through 13. The Bible says, as the Chaldeans answered the king and said, there is not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. Therefore, no king, lord, or ruler has ever asked such a things, or such things rather, of any magician, astrologer, or Chaldean. It is a difficult thing that the king requests, and there is no other who can tell it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. For this reason, the king was angry and very furious and gave the command to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree went out and they began killing the wise men and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Verse 45 says, Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. Pray with me, Father. Thank you again for the privilege we have to study your word. I ask that you will bless the reading and readers, the listening and listeners of your holy word. And our confidence is that you will fulfill your promise, that your word will not return void to you. May saints therefore be strengthened sinners be converted and may we all be made ready for the second coming of jesus christ in his holy and precious name we pray let everybody say Amen. you may be seated in the presence of god today we share with you part one of a two-part message that has been captioned the giant and the stone tomorrow we will focus on the second part of the sermon, which will encapsulate verses 24 to the end of the chapter of Daniel 2. But for today, our focus will be on Daniel 2, verses 1 to about verse 24. And we do so under the caption again, the giant and the stone. Verses 1 through 24 is introduction is an introduction to a very important dream or vision that King Nebuchadnezzar received. And tomorrow we will focus on that in details. And our purpose and objective for both these messages is to establish the authenticity of God's word and the importance of Bible prophecy, especially as it pertains to your future and to my future. I want to remind you that the Seventh-day Adventist Church, again, was birthed out of the study of God's Word. And as we journey this week, you will see this, because tomorrow we will look at this very important dream. On Wednesday, we will talk about prophecy and the issue of the judgment. On Friday, we will look at prophecy and the sanctuary. And next Sabbath, we will end by focusing on Daniel 8, verse 14, which is a very important study which literally is a very unique doctrine to our church, which no other church teaches. And we will do that, of course, making Jesus at the center. But today, we look at Daniel 2, verses 1 to 23. I want to begin by, therefore, asking if any of you have ever been in a position where you had to pray so much and prayer was the only means by which your life could be saved. Have you ever been in a position where your life literally depended on prayer? Where your life was dependent on God answering you because no one or nothing else could come to your aid or to your help or to your rescue? 
Well, beloved, if you have not been there, maybe one day you will get there. And in times like those, beloved, you can drop to your knee and pray some eloquent prayer. Sometimes in situations like those, all you can do is just call on the name of Jesus. And even if it's that one word, it is a sufficient prayer for God to dispatch the retinue of heaven, of angels of heaven, to help you and to provide just what you need. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? I want to let you know today, therefore, that sometimes God's people may find themselves in predicament where the only thing that can help them is prayer. I've been there. I've been there, beloved, and I was there in a very unique situation. You see, one day I was flying from Montego Bay, Jamaica, back to Fort Lauderdale, and as I was journeying, the plane took off. It reached cruising altitude, and then the pilot came on the speaker to make a certain announcement, and the after that experience, beloved, I'm, 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 I'm certain that the Bible is true, that you must try the Spirit, because while I won't tell you the name of that airline, all I'll tell you is this, it's the wrong Spirit, and I don't fly with them no more. Ah, the Bible says you ought to try the Spirit, beloved. Not every spirit is of God. Yeah, yeah, some of you just got that. In any event, beloved, the plane took off. It reached cruising altitude of about 35,000 feet. And when it reached cruising altitude, beloved, the pilot came on the speaker and said, Ladies and gentlemen, we've reached our cruising altitude. You can walk around if you so desire, if you need to use a lavatory or the restroom. But we encourage you, as you're seated, to keep your seat seat belts on. And uh, after he made that announcement, the stewardess decided to serve drink and snack. And at that time, it was free. These days, some of these airlines want to charge you even for the very seat belt that you buckle. Well, after they were doing that, beloved, I noticed something interesting. You see, the stewardess decided to lock their tray in its position, and no one understood why, because no explanation was given, no reason was given. The pilot didn't say anything was going to go wrong. The stewardess didn't say anything. But as soon as they locked their trays in its position, the plane literally dropped. The plane lost altitude. And it didn't lose 10 feet or 15 feet. It lost at least 2,000 feet. When that plane dropped, beloved, of course, it was chaos and pandemonium in the plane. For those who weren't seated, they were thrown in. The, to the roof of the plane. The open, the overhead bin compartments open and luggage became missile. Food that was served also became missile. And people were in one big habaloo and a pandemonium and people were in chaos. But guess whose name everybody was calling on? Hey, hey, hey. somebody ought to understand that that name is a name that is still a good name to call on, which is why David says he's a very present help in time of trouble. Let me remind the church today that if you're ever in need and you can't pray, just call on the name of Jesus. He'll be there right on time. And so, beloved, everybody was calling on the name of Jesus. I want to believe that even if you are an atheist, you are still calling on the name of Jesus. And so they were calling on the name of Jesus. And the reason I am here today is because the name of Jesus still works. What do you say? That plane landed eventually, and we were now on our way to immigration when something even more interesting to me happened, which I will never forget. While we were walking to immigration, beloved, I overheard a little boy talking to his mother and listened to what he said to his mother. The little boy said to his mother, Mommy, Mommy, that was so much fun. It felt like a roller coaster. I wish the pilot would do it again. <laughs> Hello, oh, beloved, there's a word there for somebody through the mouth of babe and suckling because there's a truth there, my friend. The little boy was convinced that what he was experiencing was a direct result of the pilot being in control and navigating the plane in such a way that it felt like a roller coaster. Can I tell somebody something today? You see, when you know Jesus is in control, when you know Jesus is your pilot, when you know you have a secure future in Jesus, things may go up 
They may go down, they may go this way, they may go that way, but you are certain that you will reach your destination because Jesus is still the best pilot for your life. That child was certain that Jesus, or Pilate rather, was in control. When you're certain that Jesus is in control of your future, you don't need to worry, you don't need to fret, you don't need to be annoyed or be anxious about life and its challenges because come what may, you know that Dr. Jesus, or Pilate Jesus rather, is still in control. Now, beloved, the only name we could call on was the name of Jesus, and the only prayer we could say was a prayer Jesus why because we were in a situation where he was the only one who could help but this is not unique to my situation it is also evident in our story for today because as you read the story in verses 21 to 24 you quickly realize that Nebuchadnezzar had a dream he forgot his dream he then called his magicians his astrologers his sorcerers and Chaldeans to tell him his dream because in his government he had an entire department designated to help him interpret the future and understand things that were hidden and things that were secret when he called them they could not tell the dream and Nebuchadnezzar said if you can't tell me the dream and if you can't interpret the dream I'm gonna kill all of you and so a decree went out for all of them to be killed but Daniel had not been there and by the time Daniel heard about this, he realized that he was in a serious problem because the Bible says this in verse 13. So the decree went out and they began killing the wise men and they sought Daniel and his companion to kill them. And what did Daniel do when he realized that death was certain? The Bible says that Daniel called his friends and they prayed together. How do I know? Listen what it says in verse 17. Then Daniel Daniel went to his house and made the decision known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they might seek mercies from the God of heaven concerning this secret so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Let me remind the church of God today that when you find yourself in a predicament where there is no other help, what you need to do is call on the God of heaven because he still hears and God still answers prayer. Do you believe God still hears and answers prayer? If you do, you ought to say amen. The Bible says that the only way Daniel could get out of this was by praying. Now the question therefore is this. Why would God put Daniel and his friends in a position where their life was at risk and the only way to get out was through prayer? Why why would God do that, beloved? And why would he do it in such a way where he gave a dream to the king, King Nebuchadnezzar, and caused Nebuchadnezzar to be anxious and then decide to kill the wise men because they could not tell the dream? Couldn't God have given Daniel the dream and then said, tell the king? Why put them in such a position? In order to answer that question, beloved, you need to realize what is the purpose of this story. This story teaches is a very important truth about the future, your future, my future, and the future of the world. And it's simply this. Don't be afraid to trust or put the, 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 the uncertain future in the hand of a certain and known God. Daniel made sure that he brought this future issue and gave it to a God that he knew. But the question still is this, why would God do that? Well, to answer that, beloved, we need to walk through the text. So walk with me carefully and listen to me intently. The Bible tells us this in Daniel 2 verse 1 onward. Now, in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams and his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. Then the king gave the command to call the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king 
king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king and listened to verse 3. And the king said to them, I have had a dream and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. Now the question is this, why would Nebuchadnezzar be so anxious about a dream? Why was this so? Well, the Bible alludes to this or tells us why in a few verses. When you read Daniel chapter 2 verse 30, it tells us that Nebuchadnezzar went to his bed thinking about the future of his kingdom. Verse 1 also tells us it was the second year of his reign. So in other words, he went to bed thinking about his kingdom in the second year of his reign, which means that his reign was relatively young and relatively new and any one of us here can attest to the fact that when you enter a new position or you get a new job or you're in a new situation sometimes it can be unnerving it can cause anxiety and you can worry about the future history tells us further that in 604 and 603 which is about the time of his second year he had to send soldiers to areas far if away from his 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 throne to subdue people who were trying to rebel against him and additionally we know that kings back then were often assassinated and there were often coups that caused them their life so the man was anxious about the future and he wanted to know about the future he goes to his bed and listen to the text listen to the text he dreams dreams the bible makes it clear in ecclesiastes chapter 5 verse 3 and way to get this, that dreams can come as a result of much work or hard work or worry. And you can have bad dreams, my friend, because you worry. And the king had dreams. In other words, look at this. The dream kept on repeating. And now we know in verse 3, he said, I had a dream. So in verse 1, it said he had dreams. But the king said, I had a dream or a dream. In other words, he kept on repeating the dream in his head, but when he woke up, the dream was gone from him. Now, what's the big deal if a dream goes away from him? The truth is this. Bible tells us that in the ancient Near East, dreams were important to the people back then. For them, they believed that the gods would communicate with them through dreams. And even for the people of God, this was so. Read Genesis chapter 4. 40 and Genesis 41. J. Joseph interpreted dreams for the butler and the baker and they were fulfilled. Pharaoh had a dream and Joseph interpreted the dream and it was fulfilled. In that dream the king realized that there would be seven years of plenty and seven years of lean and so said so done as Joseph interpreted it so it was. Additionally my friends not only did they believe that the dreams came from the gods but they also believe that if you forgot the dream, it meant that the gods could possibly be angry with you. You can therefore understand why this man was anxious and wanted to know why he was worried about his kingdom. He understood that in his culture, dreams were important. And he also understood that it meant that the gods might be mad with him. And let's face the reality. We do the same things today. Sometimes we dream things and we are anxious. The other day a friend of mine had a dream and called me and told me about it and I had to rebuke that dream because if you're from where I'm from, you do understand that you dream certain things, they have meaning. For example, if you dream that somebody is swimming with fish, what does that mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. Somebody's pregnant. So he calls me telling me he dreamt seeing me swimming with fish and I had to rebuke that in the name of Jesus. Because God has blessed us with a peer, and I told God, we don't want a spear. Somebody say amen. amen. But dreams can have significance. And for Nebuchadnezzar, the God seemed to be angry at him because he could not remember the dream, which had significance to him. And what is interesting about this, my friends, I don't want you to lose this. Nebuchadnezzar at that time was the most powerful man on earth. He had power. He had prestige. He had pump. He had popularity. And he had anything money could get him. So he could have all the pleasures of the world. But the man lost to sleep and was anxious. Let me tell you this, my friends. A lot of times, 
We come to church and we see people and we don't know what's going on with people in it because there are folks sitting right in front of me here and folks watching online who didn't sleep last night or have been losing sleep because you're worried about something that life has thrown your way. And many of us are worried even though we have, by all indications, everything that this life has to offer. You have everything you want, you have everything you need, but you're still anxious and worried about tomorrow. Which is why I tell people this. Don't be envious of others because you don't know how they sleep at nights. They can have everything this world has to offer, but that does not mean that they have peace in their heart. And let me tell you this, my friend, you can only sleep well when you know your life is secured in Jesus Christ. Which is why Paul says in 1 Timothy 6, uh, there about 1 Timothy uh, 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 6 verse 6, he says, Godliness with contentment is great gain. In other words, I don't care if I don't have all the pleasures and all the powerful things of this world. If I have Jesus and nothing else, I'm still all right. Godliness. With contentment is great gain. Stop watching people and stop watching what people have. What you need to do is be content with what God has blessed you because you don't know how they sleep. And I keep telling folks that sometimes you see the grass is greener on the other side. You don't know how high the water bill is. And these days, people might be planting fake grass. So you think it's all right, but they're not all right. What you need to be to do is to be content with what God has given you the man had all the power the world had to offer but he had anxiety and fear about the future well when he had anxiety and fear about the future the Bible tells us that he did something listen to this the Bible says in verse 2 after his sleep left him then the king gave the command to call the magicians the astrologers the sorcerers and the Chaldeans this identifies that in his government, there was an entire department of people who focus on helping him to interpret dark things or hidden things and interpret the future. These people were called magicians, astrologers, sorcerers, and Chaldeans. Let me tell you a little bit about them. The uh, magicians, beloved, were people who use certain things to tell the future. And so today, if they exist and they do exist, you would use like a crystal ball. So if you ever go to one of them and please don't go to none of them. They would tell you your future by looking in a crystal ball. The, the, the next one were the astrologers. The astrologers studied the stars and all the heavenly bodies and claimed that they are able to tell the future based on this and because of their study from ancient Babylon we now have what we call the horoscope and they're people who get up every day to read their horoscope so they will know what their future hold and they'll tell you oh I'm under this sign or that sign and so it came from ancient Babylon what's amusing about this is that people don't realize that the stars are made of stones and gases and fires you might as well study the ones that are on earth because it's the same thing that's in the sky Look at this. Then they had sorcerers. The sorcerers, beloved, are those who believe that they can talk to dead people or to your dead loved ones. And then you have the Chaldeans. These were the highest of the group. They were the most prominent, and they were the ones who responded to the king. They were the philosophers who used certain forms of natural sciences and other forms of divination and said they were able to tell the future. And so the king comes to them and says, to them I had a dream I can't remember the dream I need you to tell me what I dreamt and tell me the interpretation but listen to what they said in verse 4 verse 7 and verse 10 in verse 4 the Chaldean then the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic they said O king live forever 
tell your servants the dream and we will give you the interpretation. Look at verse 7. They answered again and said, let the king tell his servants the dream and we will give its interpretation. Look at verse 10. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, there is not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. Therefore, no king, lord, or ruler has ever asked such thing of any magician, astrologer, or Chaldean. It is a difficult thing that the king requests and there is no other who can tell it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with men. Nebuchadnezzar needed to know what he dreamt, needed its interpretation, and he, when he went to these people, they could not tell him. This teaches us a valuable lesson, my friend. If you're worried about the future, if you're concerned about the future, don't go to any palm reader, don't go to any sorcerer, magician. If you want to know about the future, the best person to go to is Jesus. Christ. <laughs> Somebody says that he is Alpha and Omega. He's beginning and end. He is the uncaused cause of every other cause. Nobody caused him, but he caused everything. And if he did that, he can tell you the end from the beginning. The best person to go to is Jesus. The Bible says they could not do that. But I want to show you something very important. Isaiah tells us something. Why they couldn't do that. Listen to Isaiah 47. Isaiah 47 verse 12 and 13 tells us why. Listen to this. Isaiah 47 verse 12 and 13. Listen to what the Bible says. Isaiah 37 verse 12 and 13 tells us this. Very important. The scripture says this. Stand now with your enchantments and the multitude of your sorceries in which you have labored from your youth Perhaps you will be able to profit. Perhaps you will be able to prevail. You are wearied in the multitude of your counsels. Let now the astrologers, the stargazers, and the monthly prognosticators stand up and save you from what shall come to you. Now this may not mean much to you, but get this. When Isaiah wrote this text, he who had existed 150 years before Babylon, but God revealed it to him, and he wrote this about Babylon. And listen to verse 14. Behold, they shall be as stubble. The fire shall burn them. They shall not deliver themselves from the power of the flame. It shall not be cool. Uh, it shall not be a coal to be warmed by fire, nor a fire to sit before. In other words, God was making it clear that the wise men of Babylon would fail. And Isaiah wrote this 150 years before Babylon was even in existence, suggesting that from its infancy, these people would be a part of its system, but it would be a failed system. Let me talk to the church of God for a minute here today because many of you are worried about your future and I'm telling you, don't waste your time, your energy and your money to go to anyone else but Jesus Christ because the Bible tells us that they failed miserably and if they fail back then, they will fail today again. And you want to know why? Let me show you why. Deuteronomy 18, verse 9 and 11. Deuteronomy 18, 9 and 11. Talking about wanting to know about the future and why you shouldn't go to these people. Deuteronomy 18, verse 9 and 11. Listen to what the Bible says. Listen to what the Bible says. 9 to 11. When you come into the land which the Lord your God has given you, you shall not learn to follow the abominations of these nations. They shall not be found among you Anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire. No human sacrifice. Or anyone who practices witchcraft. These days we glorify witchcraft as is evident in stories like Harry Potter and many others. The Bible says it is an abomination. Stop letting your children watch these things and be exposed to these things because you're literally exposing them to demons and the forces of hell. Listen to what the Bible says. The Bible says, not only that, or to soothsayers, 
or anyone who interprets omens or a sorcerer or anyone who conjures up spells or a medium or a spiritist or one who calls upon the dead. For all who do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. The Bible says magicians are abomination unto the Lord. They can't tell you anything about the future. The Bible says sorcerer is an abomination to the Lord. They can't talk to no dead because the word of God says in Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 5, the living know that they shall die, but the dead knows nothing. When you're dead, you don't go to heaven, you don't go to hell, you remain in the grave until Jesus comes again. When you're dead, you're dead. And the Bible says don't go to no astrologers. The only sign you need to be under my friend is the blood of Jesus Christ. Don't tell me you're no zodiac, no Aries or anything like that. Tell me you're born again child of God. The Bible says all of these things are an abomination unto God and the people of God must have nothing to do with them. And my friends, if the word of God says it, I believe it, I accept it, and that settles it for me. What about you? So the scripture makes it clear that these wise men prove otherwise because they could not interpret the dream. Now, beloved, here's one of the reasons I can't believe them. Even if I were the least bit <laughs> prone to believe these people or go to these people, I couldn't do that because here's why, here's why. Why is it that none of these people who claim they can read the future have ever won the lottery? <laughs> Hello? Yeah, you ever thought about that? The other day I saw the lottery was so big and I'm saying to myself, why is it that none of them can predict what the lottery numbers are going to be? If you can do that and win it consistently, then sure I'll believe in you. But there's a reason you can't, because there's only one God who can tell the future. His name is Jesus Christ. It is also amusing that these people don't even know when they're going to die. But you can tell the future? I want to let you know something today. Don't put your trust in anyone unless it is Jesus Christ. What do you say? But now watch this. Nebuchadnezzar couldn't remember his dream. The Chaldeans couldn't help him. But Daniel did something that I told you to do earlier. You see, when you can't understand life and the issues that are coming your way, don't go to any man who can't tell, who claim they can tell you the future, or any woman who claim they can look in a crystal ball, or anyone who claim that they can read the palm of hands, or anyone who claim they can talk to dead. Don't go to them. What you need to do is go to Jesus Christ. Daniel did that, my friends, because the Bible says this. Daniel did something very interesting. Number one, verse 14, notice what it says. Then with counsel and wisdom, Daniel answered Ariok. After answering with counsel and wisdom, listen to verse 17. Then Daniel went to his house and made a decision known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they might seek mercies from the God of heaven concerning this secret. And after God revealed the secret to them, they did something amazing so they did three things number one in the middle of their trouble Daniel remained calm and composed he wasn't like King Nebuchadnezzar or the other wise men let me tell you this my friend you can worry about the future all you want you're not gonna do nothing it's not gonna do anything for you because worry will not make the future better Ellen White says worry is blind and cannot discern the future but when the future throws something your way that you can't understand do like Daniel and seek God in prayer. And notice what he did. He got some friends to surround him in prayer. Let me tell you something, my friends. When you don't understand the future, the best thing to do is to have some friends that can help you to seek the God of heaven who knows all about the future. So he got his friends and together they prayed and God revealed what was supposed to be done. And when God revealed it, not only did they pray, but they had a praise a session because listen to verse 20 onward the Bible says this Daniel answered and said blessed be the name of God forever and ever for wisdom and might are his and he changes the times and the season he removed kings and raise up kings he gave wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding he reveals deep and secret things he knows what is in darkness and lights dwells with him I thank you and praise 
praise you, O God, my fathers, for you have given me wisdom and might and have made known to me what we ask of you, for you have made known to us the king's demand. In other words, beloved, when you pray and ask God for a blessing and God reveals it to you, like Daniel, you must bring a praise procession to the feet of God because when God has been merciful to you, the preacher should not stand here as a cheerleader trying to guilt you into praising God. When God has been good to you like David, you will say, I will bless the Lord sometimes. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. David said, oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Then he says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. When God is good, the people of God must bless the name of God today. The brother decided, we will go to God. And when they went to God, God did something amazing. God showed Daniel the very dream that Nebuchadnezzar had seen. But we still need to answer that important question. God, why didn't you just give Daniel the dream in the first place? Why put him in a position where his life is threatened and prayer would only be the only means of getting him out of that situation? The only means that would secure a good future for him. Well, let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. Verse 11 answers that for us. Verse 11 says, it is a difficult thing that the king requests. This is the, these are the wise men of Babylon talking. And there is no other God who can tell it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. Oh, beloved, I hope you see the beauty of God's word because this gets me excited. You see, for the wise men of Babylon, the king was asking a difficult thing because who can read your mind but God? But they said that their gods that gave the king the dream they thought don't dwell with them. He is far from them. But then Daniel went and prayed. This suggests something very important. This suggests that if the gods have it and you can get it from the gods, then you have a real connection with the gods. In other words, in other words, Daniel proved to them that while their gods were distant, his God was a personal and eminent God who was right there with him. Yes. Let me tell you about your future, my friend. You don't need to worry about your future because a God you'll serve is not a distant God who is indifferent to your needs. He's a God who is a very present help in time of trouble. Let me tell you about your God, my friend. He's not far away. He's right there, and he will be there for you. People may have gods that can't be there, but the God you serve and the God I serve will be right there, and he will be there on time. So you don't need to worry about your future because the God you serve is right there. I love to tell this story about the God who is right there, the God who is a very present help in trouble, the God who can do for you more than you can ask or think. A few years ago, a lady was in a certain predicament. You see, her son was sick in upstate New York, and she needed to get to her son. But the problem is she didn't have a vehicle, she had no one to take her, and she had no money, and her son's situation was critical in the hospital. And so she got down on her knees and reminded God, God, you have promised you're a very present help in trouble. You see the situation with my son, and you see how the future looks. But God, I'm trusting you that you will make a way where there seems to be no way. The spirit impressed her and she got up off her knees and she went down to the train station and somehow she was able to get on the train without purchasing a ticket or without being observed. When she got on the train, beloved, the train started on its way. As the train was on its way, the conductor came around collecting tickets from individuals. And as the conductor was going around, he eventually came to this woman and said to this woman, ma'am, may I have your ticket? To which the woman responded and said, sir, Sir, I don't have a ticket, but I want to tell you this. My Jesus paid it all. Hey, <laughs> when she said that, the conductor looked at her and said, Well, ma'am, I've got news for you. I don't know your Jesus, and if you don't have a ticket, you and your Jesus will have to get off right when the, ne the train makes the next stop. At the next stop, beloved, they booted her off the train, but the woman still believed in God, and so she did like Daniel. She fell on her knees, and she started 
to pray right there along the train tracks. Unbeknownst to her, beloved, something interesting was happening. You see, the train was ready to go, and the conductor radioed the driver and said, we are ready to go, to which the driver responded and said, well, I don't know what's going on here. All the controls are working. Everything seems normal, but for some strange reason, the train just ain't moving. Well, they started to worry and wonder, and everybody got agitated because they're saying, we need to go. When a man who was sitting near the woman called the conductor and said, let me tell you something. I don't know that woman, and I don't know her, Jesus, but it seems to me that we ain't going nowhere until she gets back on the train. Oh, beloved, the minute the woman stepped foot on the train, the train that was going nowhere started on its way. Why? Because the God I serve is still able to do exceeding abundantly above all you can ask or think. That's the God I serve. So why do you need to worry? Why do you need to fear? The truth is some of you here today came here burdened and you know in your heart of hearts that you're well dressed, you have a smile on your face, plastic though it be, but in your heart you are troubled and you're worried. And some of you are worrying so much that you're even worried when you're not worried. But I'm saying to you today, my friends, you don't need to worry about the future. All you need to do is put your hands in the hands of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Because he has promised, like he did for Daniel, while their gods are distant, he will be right here, right here with you. The Bible tells us that Daniel's God answered his prayer and made known the dream to the king. Why? Because your God is not indifferent to your need. He's a very present help in time of trouble. That's why I love the song, and it says this. I don't worry about tomorrow. I just live from day to day. I won't borrow from its sunshine, for its skies may turn to gray. I don't worry all the future, for I know what Jesus says, and today he'll walk beside me, and he knows what lies ahead. Many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand, but I know who holds tomorrow, and I know he holds my hands. I don't know about tomorrow, it may bring me poverty, but the one who feeds the sparrow is the one who stands by me. And the path that lays before me may be fraught with flames of blood, but I know he'll walk beside me, and I'm covered by his blood. Many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand, but I know who holds tomorrow, and I know he'll hold my hand. Many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand, but I know who holds tomorrow, and I know 
He holds my hand. Hallelujah. Is he holding your hands today, my friend? Is he holding your hands today? Because you have a bright future in Jesus Christ. Stand with me, church. Somebody's here today who needs to respond to Jesus Christ, who needs to say yes to him because life is fraught with its floods and problems and its flames. But Jesus is saying to you, just as he showed up for Daniel, he can show up for you. You're here today, my friend, and you need to come back to Jesus. Maybe you walked away from him. I want to pray for you. Maybe you've not yet given your life to him and the preacher is telling you that you need to say yes to Jesus because you will find yourself one day in a predicament where only prayer will help you. And the God I serve will be there for you, but he wants you like Daniel to say yes to him now because the gods of this world and all the things of this world will fail. But if you say yes to Jesus, if you give him your hand, he has a secure future, a secured future, and a secured tomorrow for you. Where are you, my friend? You want a preacher to pray for you today, not yet giving your life to Jesus, or you need to come back to him. Just raise that hand. I just want to pray for you. God bless you. I see that hand. Is there one more? God bless you. I see that hand. Is there one more? I see that hand. I see that hand. Is there one more? I just want to lift you up to God in prayer. I want to pray for you. I see that hand. There's a hand back there. There's a hand right there. There's one here. There's one here. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Come. Shake the preacher's hand right here. I want to pray for you right here. Come. Just come and shake my hand right here. Come. I want to pray for you right here that God will do something marvelous for you. Come. I want to pray for you right here. God bless you, mom. Come. Come with the little one. Come, my friend. God bless you. Jesus loves you so much that he wants to secure your future. Won't you come, my friend? Don't refuse prayer because Jesus is saying just as how he did it for Daniel, he can do it for you. You only, you and you and God only know what you're going through. You know the challenges you're facing. Don't ignore the fact that God loves you so much that he's given you Jesus. Jesus to walk with you into the future. Won't you come to Jesus? Come. Don't refuse prayer. Come. Don't refuse prayer. Come to Jesus. He wants to be at the center of your life, the center of your joy. God bless you, my friend. He wants to take full control of your life. God bless you. God bless you. They're coming. God bless you. God bless you. They're coming. God bless you. Let's sing that song. Jesus, you're the center. Let's sing that song as they come. Jesus, you're the center of your joy, of our joy. Put a card in each hand because we want to pray for you. We want to lift you up. We want to present you to God in prayer so that you will experience his salvation full and free. Somebody else needs to come to Jesus. You're here today, my friends. There's hope in him. Jesus. Jesus, you're the center of my joy. Sing it again. Jesus, you're the center. Jesus. Get a pen for each one so that they can write their names. We want to lift you up to God in prayer. We want to study with you. We want to lead you to know Jesus. Jesus, 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 you're the center of my joy. Jesus, Jesus, you're the center of my joy. Is there one more for Jesus? Where are you, my friend? Is there one more for Jesus? We're going to pray, we're going to pray, but is there one more for Jesus? Pray with me, Father. The future can be daunting. And oftentimes, like the king, we can become anxious when we don't know what lays ahead. But today, God, you've made it clear through your word 
that we can trust an unknown future to a known God. You are a God who has never failed and who will never fail. The truth is, God, you can do everything but fail. And so we rejoice today because we have the assurance that you are a God who is able to do more exceedingly abundantly more than we could ask or think. And Father, there are people here today who have not slept and who are dealing with anxieties and pressures of life. They are young, they are old, and you know their challenges. But the only answer to their situation is to make Jesus the center of their joy. He has promised that even if we don't know the future, but we know him, our future will be okay. And so we want to present Jesus or put him at the center of our life and at the center of our joy. So I pray for these precious ones who have walked to the altar. And I ask of you, O oh God, that you will give them joy, you will give them peace, and you help them to know that even if they're in the predicament where only prayer can help, you will be there for them. And you will do for them more they can, they can ask or think. Please, Jesus, help them to know that they will find no peace until they find peace in Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Help them to know that they'll find no rest until they find rest in Jesus. And may they give themselves entirely to him. Be baptized and be prepared for the second coming of Jesus. There are others, God, who didn't walk to the altar. And truth be told, they're experiencing turmoil, anguish, and pain. Please help them today to know that they can call on the name of Jesus. Grant them hope. Grant them deliverance. Grant them victory. And when you come, may it be that because all of us have made Jesus center and central to our lives, that we will be saved in your everlasting kingdom. This is our prayer with thanksgiving in the holy and precious name of Jesus. Let everybody say. If you've got a card, fill it out, turn it in so that we can study with you, pray with you, present your needs to Jesus and help you to grow in Jesus Christ. God bless you. Were you blessed today? I was blessed today. How about you? Yes, yes, yes. We want you to return the cards. We'll be praying for you, reaching out to you. And let me say that the only, the only, the only thing you need, the only thing you need for baptism is a surrendered heart to Jesus. Amen. You don't need to know the entire Bible. You just need a surrendered heart to Jesus as a part of a process. We'll be walking with you through it. Remember, we continue tomorrow at 7.30. Our gathering starts at about 6.30. And from 6.30 to 7.20, we'll be having fellowship and also refreshments. Join us. We start promptly at 7.30, and we'll get you out of here uh, by 8.55. You'll be home in time for the 7 o'clock news, a.m. news. But we start here at 7.30. Our program starts at 7.30. Our gathering starts at 6.30. Uh, and so please be here in time. You can leave in time. We'll be, having, we'll be having gifts, meaningful gifts. We'll have a gift desk for, for varied persons. You may just be the person who will leave here with a gift. But the most important gift we want to have is a gift of a surrendered life to Jesus. Amen. And so we continue when? Tomorrow at 7.30 p.m. right here. God bless you. And please, uh, we have a fellowship meal. You are invited to join us in our fellowship meal. But uh, we want to welcome, please give us just uh, five minutes or so to welcome officially to the family. Thank you so much, Paul and Sabrina. Where are you, Paul and Sabrina? Could you just, uh, where, where are you? Come right ahead, Paul. Come, come right ahead. Come right here. And... Uh, uh, Caleb, right? Caleb, Caleb, Caleb.
Caleb. Come right ahead, Caleb. We want to, as is our custom, could you hold this for me, please? As is our custom, just want to affirm them. We just want to affirm them. Uh, leaders who are here to join us, you can face the congregation. Um, come right ahead, Pastor Mike, as we ask for, we believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, amen, and in filling, and God has been using our dear Pastor Mike, in a special way in this regard, we're going to have to give you the gifts. But we want to, please, Pastor, just to do a special anointing. We can start with Caleb right here. God has been using him. Father, we anoint... Uh, bear with us, congregation. Bear with us, please. We anoint Caleb... God the Father, Yahweh, Yeshua Mashiach, God the Son, the Ruach HaKadosh, God the mighty Holy Spirit, commander of the battle right now. I ask that you will rest upon this young man from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet and lead him his whole life where you want him to be more anything else. Surround him with angels excelling in strength with fiery swords above and below and front, back, left, and right. And I'm asking for an anointing on his whole family, including himself. We give you honor, praise, and glory. Hashem, Yeshua, Mashiach, Adonai, Sar Shalom. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, Prince of Peace. And everybody says? Amen. 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 Sabrina. Sabrina. She's tall. Sabrina. Father, we anoint our sister Sabrina in the name of Yahweh, God the Father, Yeshua Mashiach, God the Son, Ruach HaKadosh, the God, the mighty Holy Spirit, commander of the battle. Touch her from the top of her head to the bottom of her feet. Saturate her in the blood that was shed on the cross and protect her in her new marriage with her, our brother right here. Give her everything she needs 24 hours a day, more and more of the great Ahava love of Yeshua. We put her into your hands to lead her life the way you want it to be. Hashem, Hashem. Yeshua, Yeshua. Hamashiach, Hamashiach. Adonai, Adonai. Sar, Shalom. Sar Shalom. Name of the Lord Jesus Christ, Prince of Peace. And everybody saying? Amen. 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 We know in our brother Paul here, in the name of Yahweh, God the Father, Yeshua Mashiach, God the Son, Ruach HaKadosh, God the mighty Holy Spirit, commander of the battle. I'm asking, Lord, that you will teach him to lead his family by the power of the Spirit. Teach him to be the kind of husband you want him to be more than anything else. Teach him about a deep Ahava love for his wife and for everybody he comes in contact with. Surround him with the warrior angels, excelling in strength with fiery swords above and below, front, back, left, and right. And on a daily basis, give him what he needs, moment by moment, to be the man that you want him to be. Hashem, Yeshua, Hamashiach, Adonai, Sar Shalom. In the name of the Lord, Jesus Christ, Prince of Peace. And everybody says, Amen. 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 Welcome, guys. Welcome. 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 Thank you. Thank you, church family. You're welcome to join us for our fellowship lunch and also to join the praise team. We thank God for our young people. Come on, say amen for them. And now God continues to use them to minister uh, to us. Singing, Great Are You, Lord. Anybody who wants to come up and join us, feel free, especially the youngest.
Hello, thank you all so much for watching today's service. We hope you enjoyed and were blessed by God's word. If you'd like to see more uplifting content, PlantationSDA.tv has a lot more. If you have a prayer request or something's bothering you, PlantationSDA.org lets you share it with us and we're guaranteed to pray for you. If you're ever in the Plantation, Florida area, we'd love for you to drop by. You're always welcome here. Thank you again so much for watching and have a blessed day.